We're in a series called Unstuck. And uh, I don't know if you remember the book written by um, the author of The Prayer of Jabez. And I just can't think of his name. It just slipped my mind. Uh, author of Prayer of Jabez. He wrote uh, a, life that God, uh, a Life That God Rewards. He wrote several books. I, I heard him preach years ago. And uh, he preached on the passage I'm about to talk about. And I've pretty much stolen his message. <laughs> I mean, it, it's so... It so perfectly illustrates about getting unstuck. And, and, and we all get stuck in a rut. We all get stuck in a rut. Uh, but the one I want to talk about today is called the generational rut. You know, there are five generations in the church today. There's the traditional generation. There's the boomer generation. There's the X generation. You know why they're called the X generation? Probably most people don't know this. Because the first author writing about them didn't say, well, we don't know much about them, so we're going to use the variable X for them. <laughs> And it's stuck, the, the X, Generation X. Well, then they started uh, alphabetizing them. There's a Generation Y, which is the millennial generation, all right? And Generation Z, they're called the iGen. Little small i like in an iPhone, because they're always on the iPhone. <laughs> all right? They're in the sound booth today. And they're in the sound booth today, the, 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 our, uh, our, our iGen generation. Listen. We got five generations in the church today. And somehow it is our mission. It, 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 Jesus commissioned us to reach every one of them. That is a big task. Because each one has their own likes and dislikes. And by the time you get from the first one down to the last one, they kind of count, cancel out each other on a lot of things. So that makes it very difficult in the church today. Having said all that, I don't want to talk about them. <laughs> I want to talk about three different generational ruts that are in the scriptures. And I got three, three ruts up there. See the sets of ruts on the screen? You know, people are in ruts. I get my, my message here. It's just from two verses in the book of Judges. Normally we cover a lot. And later there's a message that's going to cover three or four chapters. Okay? Today it's just two verses. Judges chapter 2, verse 7 and 10. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua, generation number one, and of the elders who outlived him, generation two. And after that, jumping down to verse 10, that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers. Another generation grew up. Three generations Three different sets of ruts, and I want to explore those this morning. So I put three chairs up here. Remember when we had chairs up here before? We have a, a chair one. This is chair number one for that one set of first generation. Chair number two for the second generation. Chair number three for the third generation. So, and each one has their own separate ruts. All right, we all have our own little ruts. So what are these generation ruts? What's, what's the difference between these chairs uh, stuck in their ruts? And I think I'm standing somewhere that's echoing. All right. The first chair has to do with spiritual, being spiritually committed, being committed, being totally all in. This is the chair Joshua is in. First generation, Joshua. This is his chair. And from the book of Joshua, we learn that Joshua, in the 24th chapter, he's coming to the end, winding down the end of his life, and he makes a statement to the next generation. And in that statement, he says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now, there's two parts to this. Personally, he's personally committed. He's in this chair, and he says, I'm firmly established. You're not budging me. As for me, that's personal. Now, I've got to say something about this guy. He's like one in a million. I've got to tell you that. He's one in a million. He's not a pastor. He's not Moses. He's not the shepherd of the, the, the nation Israel. No. He's not a priest. He's not like Aaron or Levi, a, a Levite. No, no, he's, that's, that's, that's not him. He is a soldier. That's what he is. He's a soldier. There's another soldier, his name is Caleb. And these two guys, it says that they went out and they spied out the land. They came back with a good report. And all the other spies said, oh, no, we can't take the enemy. They're, they got, they're giants. They got tall walls uh, around their cities. And, and they said, we, we, they, we can't do it. And they said, come on, let's go get them. 
these guys are saying, hey, with the Lord, we can do anything. Why? Because they follow the Lord, as the text says, wholeheartedly. We call that all in. They're all in. Everything. Their whole life. They lay it on the line for the Lord. Personally, they are all in. Personally. Now, that carries over, and he says, also, not only am I all in, but I am because I'm the head of my house. And I'm committed. I'm committing my whole household. Now, the word household obviously means your children. It means your spouse. But it's bigger than that. It means who's ever in your house, your servants. Anyone who stays in your house is your guest. He's the kind of guy that says over here, he says, hey, listen, my house, my rules. This is my house. When you're in my house, you don't talk like that. We serve the Lord here. When you're in my house, you don't behave like that. But we serve the Lord here. Joshua is totally committed. Totally committed. Chair number one. In fact, with his children, he didn't relegate their religious education to the youth ministry at church. Didn't do it. Do you know this whole thing of having a youth minister is kind of a new novel thing? Not until the, 20, the 20th century were there such a person. Prior to that, education responsibility for the welfare and the education, Christian education of the family, was in the family. In the great Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our Lord is one Lord, goes on to say, and these commandments that I give to you today, you are to impress them on your children. He goes on to say, you put them around their arm, you put them on their hands, you put them before their eyes, you put them on the doorpost. The Jews took this literally. They made phylacteries. They put little boxes with scrolls in them on their wrists. They put one around their forehead and put little scrolls in them on their forehead. And then they put these little, little Ten Commandments on the doorpost. So every time they walk in and out, there's the scriptures, okay? But what it really meant was not that you go through all these motions, but what it meant is you teach your children when they get up in the morning and you say your prayers with them when they go to bed at night. And all day long, every opportunity you get, you relate your life and their life to the true living God. Joshua says, I'm all in. Everyone in my house will serve the Lord. Totally all in. That's the way my parents were. My parents were first generation Christians. They're totally dedicated. You know what that meant? That meant every morning, my mom and dad, when they had breakfast, because my dad went off to work early in the morning, my mom got up and made breakfast for him every morning. They, they had breakfast, and they read the Bible together, and they prayed. All in. All in. That meant every time the doors at church were open, they were there. They were totally all in. All in. Now, my dad was a deacon in the church. I was one of those deacon kids because my dad, but my dad was just a pattern maker. He worked in the automobile industry. I met my dad when he got home. He was tired. He still worked in the youth ministry at the church. My dad, after he had retired, was still working in the youth ministry at the church. All in. He was all in. My mom was the same way, totally all in. Our lives revolved around, around church. My mom was not an upfront speaker, nor was my dad, but they were hard workers in the church. My mom prepared all the crafts for two weeks of vacation Bible school for a couple hundred kids. And she worked like crazy on this. And my mom would get so nerved up when she had to do the devotional because that was not her thing, talking. She was serving, but she was all in. Totally all in. That's the first chair. Wholehearted, committed to Jesus. The second one I call the spiritually conflicted chair. The person in this one is really conflicted. And we see this in Judges. Well, we don't see it in Judges too, but we're going to see it in a moment. In Judges chapter 2, it says this, in verse 7, we read the verse. 
The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders. So I got the elders up. They're in, they're in chair two. Because they had seen the great things that the Lord had done. You say, well, but where's the conflict? They don't see a conflict there. Well, there's no conflict in that verse. But remember when Joshua was speaking to this generation? This is what he says to them. Joshua said to the people, and in verse 14, it said, the 24th chapter, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your forefathers that they worship beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. Oh my goodness. Are they conflicted? Yes. Hey, they're sitting in this chair. They've been watching the life of their parents all in. But they still want stuff that's out in the world. They can't quite make the full commitment because, boy, I'll tell you, those idols are so alluring. Remember when we were in Egypt and everybody had those grand celebrations around all their idols? And, boy, I sure like that. The world seems so attractive. So they are compromised. They're conflicted. They know the Lord. How could they not? They've been living in the house with their parents. And the parents have been dragging them everywhere. They know it. But they want something more. They're also uncommitted. Because he goes on to say, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable... You know what it is? This person is a person that grew up. I had to go to church. I really didn't want to. I would have really rather played soccer. Or I would have rather, pay, and they just go on whatever they want to do. Hung out with my friends. I would have rather just slept in. There's no desire in their heart. They're uncommitted. They know who the Lord is. They know the Lord. They both know the Lord. Totally all in. Half-baked. Half-baked. They're spectators. They're spectators. The elders who outlived him, who had seen. You see, I think this is an important word. They were watching. Guess, guess what they, they saw how in Joshua and Caleb's life, they took on the giants and won. Have they ever taken on a giant? No. Left that for, for, for Joshua. Uh, they saw the walls of, of Jericho go down, but uh, did they want to do that? No. That, you, you do that. I, that's good for you. you know, I'm really just here to sit in the pew. I'm really not committed to get involved. Spectators. I'll watch what you do. They're conflicted. You know why they're conflicted? As Jesus put it this way. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or they will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Hmm. They're conflicted. Do you see why they're conflicted? They're being pulled in two directions. I'm a second person. I'm a, I'm a second generation person. My parents are first generation. I'm second generation. Here I am. I'm sitting in this chair. And I'm watching what God does in my parents' life. But, I mean, I accepted Jesus at eight years old. I mean, I, I tell you what, when I accepted Jesus, it was, boy, heaven, hell. Hell doesn't sound like a really good prospect to me. I'm going to accept Jesus because I don't want to go to hell. And so it was a fire insurance policy. I contracted with Jesus to make sure I didn't burn in hell. That's pretty much it. My heart wasn't in serving the Lord. My heart was, I don't want to get, take any pain on that comes with not knowing the Lord. And so I'm, I'm in this chair. And I'm going along in this chair, and I'm quite conflicted. I saved at 8, baptized at 12, and then I'm looking at my parents' values, and I get to the point where, do we got to go to church? You know, it was on on Sunday evening. We went, to, we went all the time. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Monday night. I mean, we, were, we, we lived at church. My whole life has been at church. But on Sunday night was the Disney program. Are you kidding me? I never got to see Disney. 
I am a deprived, frustrated child <laughs> because my parents were committed to hauling me into church every Sunday night. And I'd sit in that pew and I couldn't score them, couldn't, I just sat, there was no program for kids. I sat there and I listened and I really didn't listen. I doodled, I draw, I did, but my parents, as for me in my house, were serving the Lord. Here I was, so I don't, I don't have that commitment. I'm in the middle. So by the time I'm a teenager, I'm saying, wow, the world looks so alluring to me. I want to be popular. To be like my mom and dad, that's not real popular. Come on. Joshua and Caleb, only two out of two million people. One in a million kind of people. That's not popular. I, I want popularity, so I start abusing language. I start cheating, stealing, whatever would make me look cool among my friends because why? I'm trying to serve two masters. I'm conflicted. I'm in the middle. And I've told my story before. At 16, I experimented with drugs and it killed my two friends and it was a wake-up call like, oh my goodness, this path leads to death. This path leads to life, joy, happiness, forgiveness, pardon, eternal life. Whoa, what am I doing? I need to be all in. You see what's going on here? This person is so conflicted. Which makes me ask, why are you so conflicted? Why are we not all in? All of us. Totally committed, devoted to the Lord. And everything. Third one. Third chair. This one I might get to. This chair, this person is totally clueless. Clueless. Committed, conflicted, clueless. Watch what the text says. After that whole generation of elders had been gathered to their fathers, This generation, another generation, grew up. Huh, they're the clueless generation. I call it that way. Here. They were clueless about God. They, another generation, who knew neither the Lord. They didn't know. They didn't know. How could that be? This is the grandkids. This is the grandkids. Here's why this generation is sitting here blocking the view of that generation. How are they blocking it? Well, this generation is so compromised and conflicted. This person's looking and saying, look what they're telling me and look what they're doing. Oh, here's the person, they know all about it. They got the Christian terminology, the Christian ease down, they can talk about it. And here's a typical way. They're going to church on a Sunday morning, third generation's riding in a car with the second generation and mom and dad are having a big argument. Never happened to you? Oh, yes, it has. <laughs> Having a big argument, but as soon as they get to the church, pull in, grabs his Bible, closes the door, walks around, opens the door for his lovely wife, and go hand in hand in the church, hello, everyone, and they go in as a happy married couple. And the kids have been watching this. During the service, for some reason, the pastor calls on dad to pray. He stands up and he rolls off this eloquent prayer. Wow. That was really good. Got all the, all the language down. Because they know it. They've lived it. They were drugged to church. They got it all down, but it's not in their heart. They really don't do that. They're half-baked. The third generation sees the half-baked. Says, I can't believe that. 